All right. Then, hi everyone, also from me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I'm going to talk mostly about some results from my PhD and also some subsequent work. Um, and I wanted to use this opportunity to place the work that I did in the wider context of sea level reconstruction. So this talk will also involve some work that other people have done that I really admire. Um, yeah, I just wanted to be fun time and let's see what comes out of it. So as Uli already said, beach rock is mostly relevant uh, in the quaternary because it forms in the coastal zone on a beach, which is essentially a line. Uh, so it's uh, quite spatially constrained. It's not that there are not older beach rocks existing, it's just that it's kind of hard to find them because uh, of this spatial constraint on them. So the content of my talk, I'm going to start talking about beach rock in general, just because I like doing that so much. And then we move into long-term sea level change, short-term sea level change. Um, and in the end, I give a little wrap up of what we have learned so far and what I plan to do next, which is uh, also really cool, I think. When encountered in the wild, beach rock looks like this. So usually we see a coast parallel bend and the sediment and the texture and the color looks all really similar to the surrounding still soft sediment on the same beach. Um, it's very often on tropical beaches, which is just a nice uh, little study area to have. Oftentimes, beach rock also shows some anthropogenic imprint um, because it forms really, really fast. And this is what got me into beach rock and what still fascinates me to today. Coming from my bachelor in the Cambrium, um, I was still thinking that cool rocks always have to form over deep time, but beach rock doesn't. It forms in months to years. Um, we can often find trash like glass, but also cans and plastics in there. Um, and we have recorded in many studies beaches where the winter profile in one year doesn't show beach rock. And then in the next year, we suddenly have a meter thick succession. And to a geologist, that's just really incredible. If you want to look at beach rock definition wise, um, in a review in 2007, it was stated as such that it's a hard coastal sedimentary formation consisting of beach sediment lithified through the precipitation of carbonate cements. And there are two tiny, teeny problems with this when using beach rock for sea level reconstruction. The first one would be beach sediment. What is that? When we look at the coastal profile, we see that the term beach should include everything um, from the foreshore, so the intertidal zone, as well as the backshore, the supratidal zone. Um, and for the purpose of sea level reconstruction, beach rock is often defined more narrowly. Um, and many people argue that we should only call it beach rock when it formed strictly in the intertidal zone between the berm um, and the mean low water level. The problem with this is that a single beach rock outcrop can easily spread into the supratidal zone. It can be interlayered with cemented dune material. It can also spread into the subtidal zone and have some upper shore face sediments in there. Um, so we already have a situation where the definition that is used in sea level studies doesn't really line up with the reality um, of beach rock outcrops. The second problem comes from the from the carbonate cements. It is the most common cement in beach rock, um, especially in the tropics and subtropics, and sometimes even in higher latitudes uh, up to Scotland. But there are also a lot of other cementing agents. You can have silica. You can have ferrogenous cements, like in this example from uh, northern Spain. And, rec and recently, yes, you also found cemented beach material um, that again shows the imprint of the Anthropocene. Um, you can have materials like plastitar, which comes from oil spills, essentially cementing beach sediment, or we see also um, molten plastic from campfires cementing beach sediment. Obviously, those last examples do not play a large role in sea level reconstruction, but I just wanted to mention them um, to show that carbonate cements is not the whole reality of how beach rock can look in the fields. So if you want to 
make a little bit of a wider definition, you would include the backshore, foreshore, and upper shore face sediment. It's important that it's cemented in situ. And that is something we need to prove when we work with old beach rocks. Um, and it's not always the precipitation of carbonate cements, but also um, other cementing agents that can also be there due to infiltration rather than precipitation. This wider definition also comes with problems in uh, sea level studies. And I will get to that when we are diving into these next chapters. I want to start with the work that we did in Oman. Um, I started working on this during my master's, as Uli said. In Oman, we have a situation where we see a coastal area with marine terraces. So the coastal area is uplifting. And the working group that I was in at the time is a geo tectonic geomorphological uh, group. So they were mostly interested in reconstructing uplift rates. And these beach rock outcrops played a role in this that I'm going to explain in a second. This is an outcrop uh, that is located at the paleo shoreline angle of one of these marine terraces. We're looking at it frontally. So the original paleo coastline is behind it. It's carved into Eocene limestone. We see it a little bit popping up in the back here. And uh, this sandy and conglomerate layers of the paleo beach is plastered onto this um, paleo shoreline angle. This beach rock is dated to an age of 80,000 years um, using OSL. And it's about 100, 120 meters above mean sea level nowadays. We interpret, interpreted this fasces as back beach because we see some trough cross bedding that indicates aeolian transport. But we also see lag deposits of these gravel, these gravel layers in there. So we have some wave in, influence still um, during more high energetic events. We also see a lot of. Um, Technological features in this, something that prior to the study in Oman has not played a big role in the study of beach rock. Technology was not super well described usually. Um, so that's also something that we noted uh, that just these large crab burrows in here. So this is interpreted as a back beach, beach rock. This is the same outcrop. Um, I have out outlined the beach rock again here, and we see the paleo shoreline angle. Um, and what the beach rock was used here, it was a GPS service and survey. The goal was to reconstruct uplift rates. So we really wanted to measure GPS points at the paleo shoreline angle. And when the paleo shoreline is freshly carved, we get a quite crisp change in incline here. But of course, over time, due to erosion and the deposition of scree, that gets a little bit flattened out. So it can be quite tricky when you're in the field to see, OK, where exactly is my shoreline angle located? Um, where should I take my measurements? And this is where the beach rock came in. Um, and during my master thesis, I tried to interpret these beach rock deposits regarding to their level, uh, to their relationship to mean sea level, to see where exactly the paleo shoreline angle was located. Um, and when we looked at these beach rocks, we found that the descriptions that I made of them and the observations we made in the field didn't really line up with what is often described in the literature, because sea, especially sea level studies use this really narrow definition that I talked about in the beginning, um, that beach rock always has to be intertidal. And it's often described as seaward dipping sandy beds with a very constrained um, kind of fascist description. But these beach rock that beach rocks that we saw in Oman on at least seven different terrace levels. They had all kinds of lithofascies, very different sub environments within a very um, dynamical beach environment. So we thought maybe fascist variability in beach rocks is generally a little bit underestimated. Um, and before this is where my PhD was born, essentially. Um, and before I talk about what we did about this, I need to talk a little bit about sea level research in general. And here I wanted to highlight two projects. Um, the first one is Holsi, which is an INQUA sponsored project just done by an incredible group of people. They want to determine rates, mechanism, and geographic variability of sea level over the past 20,000 years. And the second project is PALSI, which is a working group that's 
essentially brings together different modelers from ice sheet to climate to sea level um, to define our observational constraints on past sea level change. And out of this um, second project came the World Atlas of Last Integration Shorelines, which is uh, same as what came out of the whole sea project, a standardized approach towards sea level uh, reconstruction. Because the whole point of sea level reconstruction on different coastlines is to expand our knowledge on global sea level change way past our instrumental record that is, of course, very, very short, ge geologically speaking. Um, and we need geological archives to expand that further into the past to make any meaningful further um, future predictions for coastal communities. And since this work is done by a lot of different peoples around, people around the planet, uh, a standardized approach was really needed. And this is what these two project provide, projects provide. What comes out of this are maps like these. This is the whole sea map. Um, this is a standardized world map of Holocene sea level indicators. There are a lot of different sea level indicators. And in this project, there were approaches defined for each single one of them. What is interesting about this map is that we see some research gaps. Some ocean basins are very well studied in regards to sea level, like the Northern Atlantic um, and other ocean basins like the Southern Atlantic or also the west coast of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific are not as well studied in regards to long-term sea level change. This is partially due to funding, but also partially due to the availability of sea level indicators. Now, what do I mean by that? Sea level, a sea level indicator can be many things, basically anything that has some relation to sea level. It can be landforms like beach rocks or coastal terraces. It can be biologically any sessile organism like barnacles or also corals. It can be archaeologically. Some structures that have a relation to sea level like harbors can also play a role. In the North Atlantic, if I go back to the map real quick here, what we mostly use is peat um, and salt marsh deposit that contain microorganisms like diatoms. We just have a large availability of these sediments here and they are therefore very well studied and we have a good grasp on Holocene sea level change in these areas. In other areas, especially in the global south, there are large data gaps um, and here you won't find any, um, not a lot of salt marsh deposits so you are forced to use sea level indicators that are a little bit more different to handle, uh, difficult to handle like beach rock. Now, what do you need for this standardized approach to turn an indicator into a sea level index point or an SLIP? You need four things. You need the location, which is usually just the GPS data, as long as your indicator has not been transported. You need an age. It has to be an absolute age. Uh, relative age will not cut it in this um, in the reconstruction of paleo sea level. You need an elevation and you need the tendency. So has the ocean moved up or down relative uh, to the indicator. The elevation is especially interesting to me since this is where sedimentology comes in. Um, because to use an indicator as a sea level index point, you have to establish indicative meaning which is the measurements that we need to perform to quantify um, the elevation change. And indicative meaning has two components. The first one is the reference water level, so the water level at which the indicator forms at present. In this example here, if I find a, list, a line of dead barnacles somewhere above um, the spray zone nowadays, then I would go to the same coastline and see where is my colony of living barnacles, and that would be my reference water level. Of course, that is not always one specific height, but this is a range, and this is what then call, is called the indicative range, so the vertical range over which an indicator occurs at present. And you need to measure these two things to establish the elevation change um, that has happened since our line of barnacles was alive. Now, with barnacles, you don't really need sedimentology to do that. Um, with beach rock, you absolutely do. This is a beach rock outcrop that we looked at in Oman. We see that it is sitting on the storm berm of this mixed gravel sand beach. 
this is a student who was doing her master thesis at the time. And when you take a sample here and the sedimentary features of this layer that you are looking at indicate formation in the lower intertidal, what you would do to, in, to um, establish indicative meaning would be to measure where the mean low water to mean tidal level are nowadays. Um, the reference water level is then the midpoint of this indicative range. And the error that you want to assign uh, to your elevation change would in this case be half of the tidal range. So we have very specific standardized um, measurements that we apply to use beach rock as a sea level indicator. And it becomes immediately clear that sedimentology is maybe the most important step in this because you need to interpret the fasces in relationship to mean sea level before you can make any assumptions about elevation change. Um, and the problem with beach rock is also that the error in this case um, can be fairly high because it's so interpretation based. And this is also where this narrow beach rock definition comes from because people wanted to avoid that and they wanted to concentrate on fasces that are really easy to spot and easy to identify, like the intertidal, which has very distinctive features. Um, so this is where this whole, we need to define it narrowly comes from. Um, and very important work on this was done in 2015 by Moss et al. They um, published this paper where they linked lithological and petrographical features of beach rock to the application of the indicative meaning. Um, pro is you have a very easy application because you have just a, a few features in this graph that you need to observe, cement habitus, uh, cement geochemistry, and some sedimentological sedimentological features, and then you can apply your beach rock as a sea level indicator. The problem is that many beach rock outcrops might not show these features, but different features. Um, and we, when we saw the very different fasces in those beach rocks in Oman, we thought maybe there are other um, fasces within there that we could interpret in a context of sea level research. And that's what we did for my PhD. Um, obviously, we started this work in Oman because we've already been there and it has a lot of beach rock. So we looked at them first. And then we thought, since the PhD is really um, time constrained, you only have a couple of years to complete that, especially when you do it on a scholarship. We thought we would look at one more coastline uh, with different boundary conditions to just get even a better grasp on beach rock fascist variability, what could be in there potentially. Um, and we went to South Africa for this purpose where we met some scientists on a, a sea level conference there. And we went to this beach on the conference field trip. And there's just a three to four meter platform of beach rock sitting right there. Um, and in comparison to Oman, it has a way more humid climate behind these coastal dunes here that border these beaches Land on the landward side, there's an extensive wetland, so you have a lot of meteoric water, whereas in Oman, uh, you don't have a lot of that, surprise. And we also have a much higher energy level, so the significant wave height is very high in South Africa. You have lots of um, big wave events, whereas in Oman, everything is a little bit more chill. So we had these two coastlines um, to begin with to understand beach rock fascist variability better. What came out of this is essentially this. We made a somewhat renewed beach rock fascist model. We included gravel beaches for the first time um, because we realized that a lot of beach rocks are gravelly and not necessarily sandy. So these would automatically fall out of the standard approach that existed before that. And we thought, why? If you can also interpret them in a sea level uh, context, we should attempt to do that. Um, and we also included ignologically data that didn't really uh, show up in the model before. Um, yeah, so we try to link these many different fascists that we found on these two coastline to indicative meaning. And for some of them it worked and for others it didn't work so much, but uh, we expanded the overall knowledge that is there on beach rock fascist variability and how to interpret beach rocks that are a bit more tricky and not seaward dipping sandy beds. So 
no matter how well you apply your indicative meaning to a beach rock outcrop, there is one more thing that you have to do before it's a sea level index point, and that is age. I didn't do anything to make the a, the dating of beach rock easier or better or more applicable, but I still wanted to mention it because it's a common uh, problem. Generally, you can use OSL or radiocarbon. Um, OSL is applied to quartz grains. Radiocarbon can be applied either to shell material or cement. All of these, in theory, should yield the same result um, because the time between sedimentation and cementation is so short. But in reality, uh, that often doesn't happen. So for OSL, you need to reconstruct the change of dose rate during burial, which can be tricky in a system um, where you have sediment coming from the marine realm, but also from land, um, and you have different transporting agents acting. Um, and for radiocarbon, you need to make corrections. The marine Reservoir effect plays a role when you have primarily marine water, but also hard water effect can play a role when you have a lot of meteoric water involved. And again, the beach zone is the worst place um, to have to untangle these effects. So in reality, what we often see is that the ages of shell material agree better with OSL ages. And it's oftentimes it makes sense uh, to use shells that have a good color preservation if you can find them, um, because then you know that they haven't been transported for too long before getting cemented into the beach rock outcrop. Um, but then again, this is not my work. This is just um, a disclaimer that dating can also be tricky for beach rocks. I want to come back to Mission Rocks for a moment. So this is the same beach in South Africa that I was talking about here on the map. You can see Lake San, Lu Lake San Lucia. Um, with Catalina Bay that would play a role in a second. And the beaches on this coastline are really long, linear, um, and they have this extensive rocky platforms that sit in the intertidal, but also in the supratidal up to four meters above mean sea level. Um, and the high energy level of the coastline is also shown in this boulder ridges that additionally form. So you have the platform is actively quarried by wave action and then um, thrown onto land as well. Originally, we went there because you have a lot of beach rock, and we thought lots of beach rock means lots of different beach rock fascies. So let's look at this. Um, but we found some other interesting things. We went to this platform and did a bunch of logging. This is the black dots here. And we realized that in some of these profiles, we found layers that were distinctively different from the rest. And they seem to, we interpreted them as a, ch as a change in the morphodynamic state of the beach. They usually show an erosional base, which is not very surprising in a beach setting, but they also show lots of concave up and vertical shells or even disc-shaped glass that are cemented in an upright position. Um, we see very angular beach rock glass up to boulder size that seem to have been broken off from the platform and immediately redeveloped deposited and re-cemented. And we see a heightened percentage of exotic glass within these layers. Um, these are cobble-sized bedrock glass that come from river mouths hundreds of kilometers away that are not in the sediment on the beach right now. And they're not in the sediment um, that we interpret as the basic fair weather conditions of this beach rock. Um, but they are in these really messed up, texturally chaotic um, what we interpreted as tempestites. The problem with this is that you don't necessarily expect tempestites in beach rock because storms tend to remove a lot of sediment from coastline, not deposit it there. When people are looking for storm sediments, they usually look in lagoons. They maybe look on the shelf, they look in the deep sea, but they're not very often looking on the beach. Um, and there come these in these dead, these red spots that were on the map. Um, the rocky platform in Mission Rocks was quarried during World War II, resulting in these blasting fractures um, because they built like an airplane base in Catalina Bay, right behind the dunes bordering this beach. And above these 
blasting fractures. And within these blasting fractures, we found a beach rock that must have formed after that. Um, and that has a surprisingly similar texture to this presumed tempestite layers that we found within the platform. And this beach rock is filling up cracks, it's filling up potholes, and it's blasted over the flat surface uh, three meter above mean sea level. It's very surprising to find young beach rocks like that, um, less than 70 years old, on a surface that is so exposed to constant and so far above mean sea level nowadays. So that we really didn't expect to find this. Um, and the surprises didn't end there when we looked at the cements. What you would expect in a supratidal um, setting in a humid climate with would be meteoric cements, and it would be uh, cements indicating um, precipitation in the Vados zone. So you would expect to see some meniscus cements and um, little microstalactites, things like this. Um, and the cements that we actually found are the ones marked in green now, um, indicating so the cement habitus indicated more marine waters um, as that the cements were precipitated from marine waters. And also the cement patterns didn't indicate the Vado zone, but a pore space completely filled with water. So that was a second surprise. Um, and to get all that into a depositional model, we thought, okay, what might be happening here, um, I'm happy to discuss this, is that we have this platform situated in the intertidal and supertidal. It's breaking down constantly. We have this boulder ridge accumulation. We have the formation of potholes and fractures. And then we have events that in the, in the, when the storm turns and the energy becomes less, large amounts of sediment are remaining onto the platform and within the um, erosional features. And we can also have pooling of marine waters. We do see tidal pooling in the intertidal. Um, in fair weather conditions, you don't see it in the supratidal parts of this platform, but we know that it's possible because this platform is very thoroughly cemented. So you could imagine that you have um, like marine water getting caught in these erosional um, depressions and cementation happening there. After we observed this with these very young beach rocks, we were a little bit more sold on the idea that a beach rock platform could also record storm events that are much older. And we went into the literature and there's one, two papers about beach rock used as a storm archive. And the main takeaway is that you need a very thorough textural char characterization of grain sizes, shapes, and sorting. Taphonomy helps a lot, um, both macroscopically, but also microscopically. Um, and But if you have these things, then you can really differentiate different hydrodynamic states of the beach, and you can actually use beach rock as a storm archive. Um, there are, as I said, few, but there are examples of swash rich storm deposits recorded in beach rock. And I think the stuff that we see in Mission Rocks is one of these examples, which is very neat because the Southwest Indian Ocean is very poorly studied in relation to um, past storminess. And same as with long-term sea level change, we need a good grasp on what is happening in the past to make predictions for the future and to give good information to the coastal communities living there. One little problem with beach rock in the reconstruction of short-term events, again, the dating um, hasn't become any easier in, since we shifted our focus from long-term to short-term sea level change. Um, and also, it is very extremely site specific. Um, you need to know exactly where your sediment transport happens, where your sediment is stored in the whole system, and when, what, under what energy conditions certain types of cements um, and textures are achieved in your beach system. And this is, will be different for every single beach, which is why there is not really a standardized approach to use beach rock as a storm archive, and it hasn't been done a lot. Um, yeah, so a little couple of words. So this project is currently shaping into a DFG proposal that I will hopefully finish uh, soonish. 
Um, we have for this coastline in South Africa some evidence from shelf material that there was there were that there were uh, times in the Holocene and Pleistocene with a bigger storm intensity, and we think that is they think that is due to sea surface temperature being higher and shifting these tropical cyclone tracks that are currently going over Madagascar onto the Mozambique uh, coastline further to the south in the past. And this is also a scenario that, that could happen very likely in the future. So I think it's really worth it to try to understand this. And what we do want to do in this project is basically follow these rocky platforms. First, the ones that are in South Africa marked in red. Uh, the red dot is Mission Rocks that we already looked at. But these similar rocky platforms also occur in Mozambique and they also occur on the Madagascar coastline. So potentially there could be even more beach rocks that recorded some form of storminess. Um, we still have to figure out the dating, um, but we have some ideas. So yeah, let's hope that we can attract some funding. And if there's any students here who would like to work on something like this, drop me an email. Uh, maybe we can do something together. This also brings me almost to the end of this whole thing. Um, I just wanted to wrap this up really quick with some lessons learned and the way forward. Beach rock is suitable for reconstructing long-term and probably short-term sea level change. We might still be underestimating fascist variability. We just, in, our, in my PhD work, I just went to two study areas and we found so many different beach rocks and so many different um, formations that there's probably more out there, although I'm aware that more of the same is not a very popular uh, research goal, but anyway. Dating of beach rock remains challenging, but not impossible. Um, and the application of beach rock in any context is always site specific, no matter if you want to do it um, for long term sea level change or short term sea level change. And this is more so than for other sea level indicators. Does that mean that we shouldn't use beach rock? No, because there is just a lot of it globally and especially in areas that are historically understudied and that need better data. Um, the coastal communities there need better data about past sea level change. So we should definitely look at beach rocks, even when it's a little bit more tricky than with other indicators. Now, what ne what's next? Two more slides. Um, I think for a long time, people have tried to explain beach rock cementation just with physical and chemical um, parameters. But in the recent decade, this whole microbe story has popped up because in almost all beach rock sediments that I've ever seen, we find micritic envelopes, a little rim of micrite around the grains. They can either be constructional, so not penetrating into the grain surface, or they can be uh, destructional with these little bore holes um, and an additional rim forming around it. We also see pore filling micro micrite fairly often that contains um, filaments that could be interpreted as a result of EPS, um, extracellular polymeric substances. Um, and sometimes they also so, show laminae. And all of these fabric observations indicate that microbes are playing a very big role. And many papers also have uh, looked at individual groups of microbes that are precipitating carbonate actively. And I think it's not too far-fetched to ask the question on what are the environmental constraints on this microbial communities? What different communities are there? How are they functioning? Um, and this is something that I've been really interested in in the recent times. And there are two things that we don't really well, that we don't understand very well. One is the microbial community as a whole. We have isolated individual agents and shown in the lab that they are precipitating carbonate, but how different groups of microorganisms function together, we don't understand very well. And we also don't understand how microbes that are observed in the lab boring into carbonate surfaces actually do that. Um, the group that has been observed doing that the most uh, in the lab are cyanobacteria um, and their metabolism, since they do photosynthesis, should lead to the secretion of carbonate, but not necessarily the removal of carbonate. And to get in this whole microbe topic, 
I teamed up with a biologist also from TU Darmstadt um, and we got some funding from the university um, that focuses on interdisciplinary projects. And what we wanna do, um, this biology group um, genetically modifies cyanobacteria to make a certain um, enzyme on the cell surface that catalyzes this reaction from um, CO2 in dissolved in water to bicarbonate, which can then be taken up by the cyanobacteria. Um, and we think that taking up bicarbonate from a hard surface could also lead to this boring effect. So what the plan is for this project is to um, genetically engineer different forms of the cyanobacteria that have either a lot of this enzyme or just a little bit of this enzyme and basically smear them onto these calcite chips and then make a correlation analysis like who does more of this enzyme also means that we get a larger bore volume of borings. So we just started that. Um, again, there's room for students working in this. Um, there's room for master thesis, bachelor thesis. So if anyone is here uh, who want to send me a student or is a student themselves, please drop me an email because I think this is really cool. Um, yeah, with this, I'm at the end of my VTRAC talk. Thank you so much for your attention and thanks to all these people um, that have really gotten me into the C-level story. <laughs>